Hello there, this is a summary of chapter 2 of the course Introduction to Networks and it's about configuring an operating system for a network device. An operating system is the responsible for enabling the hardware of a device in order to do its function. Basically, every device that is connected to the internet has an operating system. An operating system can be divided in three sections, shell, kernel, and hardware. The shell section refers to the interface that enables the user to communicate with the computer to do a specific task. These tasks can be requested from a graphical user interface or from a command line interface. The kernel section is in charge to communicate the software with the hardware to do the desired task. It is also the responsible to manage how the hardware resources are used in order to meet the software requirements it needs. And the hardware section, as you already know, is the physical part of a computer including the underlying circuits of the device. For network devices, the operating system, also known as firmware, allows us to configure network devices, such as the routers we use in our homes. By using a specific commands, we can make the device to do a specific task, such as configuring a password to access a network, assign an IP address, do routing to improve the quality of a network, manage the network resources to give some maintenance, offer quality of service and establishing a specific configuration for the interface in order to improve the connection with other devices. There are numerous methods to access the operating system of a network device. The most common methods for this are from the console port of a router, by the telnet method, by the security shell protocol and from the auxiliary port of a router. The console port allows us to have an out-of-band access to a network device. This type of access can be done via a special cable connected to the console port for maintenance purposes. Thanks to this, it allows us to configure the network device even if we don't have a network services available. The main disadvantage of this method is that it doesn't have any kind of security configured to prevent unauthorized access, although a password can be configured later on. Telnet is a remote access method and can be accessed to it via a command line interface. This method requires active network services and an established IP address to be used. The security shell protocol is very similar to the telnet method. Both of them are remote access methods. What makes the security shell protocol different is that it has more security in the network services. Not only it requires a password to access the network device, but the information that is sent through it is encrypted, meaning that everything in this kind of network remains private. The auxiliary report establishes a remote session via a telephone connection utilizing a modem connected in the auxiliary report from a router. Similar to the console port, me port method, this one allows us an out-of-band access and doesn't require active network services to be configured. It can also be accessed by an administrator through a remote access when the network services fail. When accessing to the network operating system, the command line interface uses a hierarchical structure. In each of these modes, specific commands and functions of the router become available. The four main configuration modes are user executive, privileged executive, global configuration, and a specific configuration. The user executive mode is the first one we encounter when we access to the command line interface and it's limited to very basic operations. It is, con it is considered a be only mode as it doesn't allow us to change the device's configuration. The privileged executive mode allows the user to access to the management and configuration commands of the device. In this mode, the other two modes can be accessed global configuration mode and a specific configuration mode. In the global configuration mode, the configuration commands change so that the entire device is affected. In this mode, we can configure a particular part of the router, such as configuring a network interface. Both user executive mode and privileged executive mode are primary operation modes and by default, they don't count with a password to prevent unauthorized access although it is recommended to establish one when the device is configured. One of the simplest devices to configure in a network is a switch, as it doesn't require any prior configuration in order to make the switch to work. 
It's very similar to a router, as both operating systems share a very similar structure and some operating commands. They also share an exact initial configuration when they are implemented. A switch is considered a fundamental part when creating a network. This is because when connecting two computers to it, both of them can communicate with each other almost immediately. When configuring a switch, it's necessary to configure a unique name to it. This is known as hostname, and it helps us to identify the network device more easily when maintenance needs to be done. Passwords are the primary defense against unauthorized access to network devices. Here are four of them. Enable password. This limits the access to executive mode. Enable secret. This works the same by limiting the access to executive mode, but this is also encrypted. Console password. Limits access using console operations. VTY. Limits access through Telnet. We use the enable secret command to provide a greater secure password by encrypting it. As mentioned before, we also have the enable password command. This also works by generating a password that allows us to establish an authentication to gain access to the executive mode. The difference relies on the encrypted password making this last one safer. Here we show an example provided where it shows the configuration lines as an example. We can see that by using the enable command there is no need for password, but after enabling the enable secret command it asks for a password now. This way we have a safer and more reliable network. The network devices needs to always be protected. This is why access should only be allowed by a password. This way there is less risk of network infiltration through any device. Here we show that with line console 0 command we enter in configuration mode. Password line lets us specify a password. Finally, the login command enables the switch to ask for a password before logging in. Now that we have a password and login is enabled, we will need to verify authentication before accessing to the device. BTY lines allow access to the device via Telnet, which is a remote connection. The router supports 16 VTY lines. These are from line 0 to line 15. This is where we need a password to turn on the lines. We also have other commands to help us maintain the network safe while visualizing the configuration files. This is the service password encryption command. This command is similar to the previous known as enable secret, where we were able to create an encrypted password, but in this case it only encrypts passwords in the configuration files. The purpose is simple, to maintain the configuration files safe from dangerous and non-authorized individuals. In the code we enable the command and this is why it does its job by encrypting passwords. Passwords are essential, but it is also important to mention banners as a useful tool to maintain security in your network. An advertisement or warning that indicates gravity or danger can keep non-wanted users out of the network. Do not underestimate the use of banners. In case of needing to investigate any suspect, some legal systems forbid monitoring or persecution for users unless you have a banner to warn them. The content may vary. It is said to users that need to access the network. There are different kinds and have a simple setup. You can even use banners to provide useful information. Configuration files were mentioned before when talking about passwords. These files tell us the current device configuration and the commands that determine the networks. Configuration files are stored in what we know as RAM random access memory. That's why they are always active when the device is running and we can lose information if it is not saved before entering its process. These files have a pre-established setup which is called startup configuration files. These are stored in the NVRAM. This means each time the network devices start running the startup files are executed. 
Any permanent changes need to be saved in here. You can also save data in a configuration file backup in a text document. This image shows the easy way to do it. The method is similar to how we always save text files. First, use the like log, then the location. After capture has been started, you can execute the show start of config command at the privilege execute prompt to make sure that the data stored is the correct one. The second image shows how to save data from the terminal. The use of IP addresses is the primary means of enabling devices to locate one another and establish end-to-end -end communication to the internet. Each end device on a network must be configured with IP addresses. Some examples of end devices are computers, networks, printer, phones, security cameras, smartphones, and mobile handheld devices. Network communication relies on end user device interfaces, networking device interfaces, and the cables that connect them. That is all the network and the way it is connected. Each physical interface has specifications or standards to define it. This means that every single cable connecting to the interface must be designed to match the physical standards to the interface. These different cables can be copper cables, fiber optic cables, coaxial cables, or wireless. All this depends on the distance, environment, amount of data, and costs. To access the switch remotely, an IP address and a subnet mask must be configured on the SVI, which is switch virtual interface. IP address together with the subnet mask uniquely identifies the end device on the internet network. Subnet mask determines which part of a larger network is used by an IP address. In the next lessons we are going to learn more about the IP address. We can configure the switch with commands to gain access remotely. If we want to configure the IP address of end devices we can do it with the IP address and subnet mask on the SVI as mentioned before. We need to access network settings as shown in the image. The DNS server address is the IP address of the domain name system server, which is used to translate IP addresses to web addresses such as www.cisco.com. The DHCP or Dynamic Host Configuration Protocol allows end devices to have IP information automatically configured. It is a very useful technology that allows us to search for addresses in less time which makes tasks easier and faster. If a static IP address is defined for a network device, for example a printer, then a DHCP server is installed, duplicate IP address conflicts might occur. The solution relies on the DHCP server it is needed to exclude the static IP address of the end device from the DHCP scope. This lesson also shows us different ways to check connectivity. The ping command is used to verify the internal IP configuration on a local host. There are also commands to verify the IP interface and check switches. If we successfully reach our target, we can confirm the connectivity of the server. That is all for chapter 2. Thank you very much for your attention. Have a really good day.